Last week we uh, lingered quite a while in, um, in Ephesians. Like I said, if we aren't careful, and it, it's not that it's a bad thing to do, but I know it's just not what everybody here particularly is excited about doing, and that is spending one week on each of the churches. So, uh, what what I'd rather do is is um, after spending some time in Ephesians, like we did, because it was an important one to do, and I think it kind of set the tenor for the kinds of things we're looking at when we're looking at if you're on your own, going to continue studying in depth the um, letters to the seven churches, the kinds of things that you might look at, but. Let's try to take an overall look um, this time. Why these churches? And we covered this before. We'll pop through this real quick again. Um, these were seven actual churches at the time, as we discussed. They, uh, they aren't, weren't the only churches in Asia Minor, not the only churches in Turkey, but they were picked out by Christ when he's dictating this to John for a particular reason. You'll notice, you know, why is why is the uh, church at Rome not there? Where where is the church at Jerusalem? Where is the church at Thessalonica at Corinth? You know, there are a lot of churches, but but they weren't uh, they weren't being addressed. I think there's a reason for that, and um, a very good reason for this. And there are very few people out there who will disagree with this. Um, with this notion that these particular churches represent seven eras or seven periods in time in chronological order through history. What they will disagree with is there's a little bit of bleed overlap on the years of these different eras. These uh, seven different, seven churches also represent seven different types of churches as well as, as I'll put this up here too, seven different types of church people. So personality-wise, there are characteristics that apply to these churches that also apply to our church and other churches. But within those churches, we all can be different types of people. Like last week, we, we discussed Ephesus and discussed how they, they were doctrinally really right on. They had their theology correct, but they had left their first love, they they got to be a little bit cold and, and cold toward people. I, I don't know if sometimes that can happen to where you can be in a struggle, you're in the fight, you know, you're like a soldier out there, you're in the trenches, and you get so used to that, your compassion kind of diminishes or what, but the first love is what we see when we come to know Jesus Christ, and we... Um, love people, we pursue him, we have the kind of love toward one another that Christ has toward us and that kind of a thing. So it's, it, you know, um, obviously the caution is that we don't ever want to get that way. We do like to keep keeping the doctrine correct and so forth. But So that was one of the kinds of things that we discussed. Um, this is one version of this, and... Um, I emailed it out, and if you didn't get it or you need a copy, let me know. This is this was one version, though, um, kind of interesting. So let's take a look at this in a broad sweep before we start getting into looking at actual things we'd like. Uh, I would like to call out anyway in the churches, and that is, um, let's take a look first at the era. At Ephesians, Ephesus covers roughly the the entire, or you know, what was left of however long the church was, right? Uh, roughly 30 A.D. to about 100 A.D., and that's the apostolic church, the original church. Um, and then from about 100 to about 300 or so, 312, was the church at Smyrna. And uh, there were the persecuted church. There was persecution earlier. There, in all of these churches, at some point or another, there was some level of persecution. But... Um, there was the apostolic church, there was a lot of uh, persecution, but as difficult as that was during that era, um, we also had the church of Smyrna where it actually ramped up a little bit. And um, in that first church, Ephesus, during that era, we still had um, Christians being thrown to lions, we had Christians persecuted. 
um, used as lanterns for parties, <laughs> you know, uh, torched. <laughs> All kinds of horrific things that happened to those people. But yet, the persecuted church for Smyrna it was really, really particularly awful. Um, Pergamum, um, you know, as it says here, it's the indulged church. We'll get into what that means. Thyatira was really pagan. That really overlaps the Catholic Church to a great degree. Degree, and you'll see the word works used, what, three times, four times in that little passage. We'll go through that. Sardis was the dead church, and um, brings us up to roughly about um, probably closer to, it, it's, okay, what, what this chart says is church at Sardis, the dead church, 1520, and up to the tribulation. Are there dead churches out there now? Yeah. Um, that was the church during the Protestant era when it was coming out. Um, it, you know, it was reforming, but it was still very much was a, a heavy Catholic influence, and they were digging out of that. I would tend to put this where it says Church of Philadelphia, 1750 to the rapture. Again, that's going to vary from church to church. See what I mean? There's a lot of bleed in Philadelphia, hold fast of what you have. And um, he says, I'll make him, who, whoever overcomes, I'll make him a pillar and write upon him the name of God and my new name. Uh, and yes, up to the rapture. Laodicea, they have starting about 1900, maybe. I, you know, I put Laodicea definitely starting about, at least by 1950, um, definitely in full swing. It's, we had a lot of, by the time you get to the 1950s or slightly earlier, I guess you get liberalism in full swing. Definitely in the 1960s, 1970s, the mixed church, the lukewarm church, um, is in full swing now. And, and that is where you cannot go by denomination anymore when you're looking for a church. It's really difficult to find a church that isn't all about the, the production, the likes, the music, um, not as much about Christ. Um, like the old photos, or photos, paintings, they'll show photos. Yeah, that'd be good. The old paintings where they show Jesus at the door, and he's knocking at the door. People say, you know, like it says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Like Jesus is supposed to be at the door of your heart knocking to get in. Well, no, that passage is about the church at Laodicea, and, and Jesus is on the outside of the church asking to come in. You know, so that's, where he's at today. We don't see a lot of Jesus in a lot of these churches now other than he, we hear his name. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, so let's go through some of these real quick. We'll belabor these as we go through. So um, we'll, read, we'll read through this quickly. Ephesus to the angel of the church of Ephesus, right? And as we discussed, angel is the messenger and be the pastor of that church. The angels themselves, if they were heavenly angels, they do not have a message to deliver. They don't, they don't come down and speak to us and deliver a message. And they also don't need um, to get corrective words. They're servants of the Lord. They do as the Lord asks them to do. But no, this has to do with the messengers, the pastors of these churches. These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hands, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored. There's the word labored again. Work hard labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you, from where you have fallen. Repent, and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and will remove your lampstand from its place. The lampstand being, as in Revelation 1, it actually is the church. I will remove your church. 
And eventually this is what happened. Unless you repent. But this you have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And we also touched on that briefly, how there is a paradise and there in paradise, a tree of life in paradise. And we also see that in New Jerusalem at the end of the book of, of Revelation. So then, that brought us up through last week, Smyrna now, the persecuted church, says this, and, and to the angel of the church in Smyrna, right, this is verse 8, these things says the first and the last, who is dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich, and I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. And you will have tribulation ten days, which is kind of a euphemistic way of saying for a long time. It's going to seem like a really long time, so ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. In the second death, there are two deaths, right? The first death is, is the physical death. Your body dies. Theoretically, without the intervention of the Lord in some way, we all die the first time. Um, I'm sure we all in this room would like to be raptured and not have to see any of it. But the second death is your spiritual death if you're not a believer. And it's eternal separation. The first one is death being separation of the body from the spirit. Second death is we are in, come into this world separated from God. And so even if you're martyred, you're not going to suffer that that second death because he's talking to the church here. So this is a promise to, to comfort them is that, you know, uh, you might die, you might be martyred, but it, it'll all be sweet. So in this passage, <clears throat> what are a couple things that you that you might notice? They didn't get a reprimand. They, 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 they did not. You're right. They got no correction at all, nothing that needed to be straightened out. Anything else? I thought that synagogue that belongs to Satan, I mean, I know it's not relevant necessarily to the church, but for him to put it like that is harsh, you know, mm -hmm. and there are churches, there are people that actually are out there worshiping Satan. You yeah. forget, I mean, I forget that. I forget that there are people out there that are that wicked and whatnot. I guess I'm so soft to think about it. And, and is it too far off the mark, too, to say that if you say, even if you say that you're worshiping Christ, but... He says, um, and I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Is it not too, is it, is it too far off the mark to say that the common, everyday Hebrew roots movement that we see right now does not kind of fit that? There's, there's, um, there is the sacred name movement, for instance which is a form of like the Hebrew roots movement that says that if you don't pronounce Jesus's name correctly, oh, no, I'm sorry, it's Yeshua. And they'll, they'll argue among themselves, no, it's Yeshua. They'll fight among themselves about the correct pronunciation of Jesus, and they will say that you're going to hell if you're not pronouncing the name of Jesus correctly. That's how ridiculous they get. A lot of the Hebrew roots movement, they say there are Jews, they're the true Jews, the true Hebrews, and, and they insist on um, works you know you go to church on Sunday if you want to but you better keep the Sabbath you know and so they have those separate and they and you better keep all the feasts and but they don't have a problem sometimes wearing you know really what's your what's your shirt made of you know it's well it's 50 percent cotton 50 percent polyester oh you just broke the law in leviticus about mixed <laughs> fabrics you know <laughs> so some certain things that they like to put themselves 
in a high and mighty, holier than thou type of a position with regard to the rest of us, like they're keeping the law, it's important, or you won't be going to heaven, and that's what most of them say. Uh, you won't be going to heaven because you're not keeping God's law, and you're supposed to keep God's law. So there were Jews at the time. As we know, we, we read most thoroughly in uh, Romans, um, the Judaizers would come along and say, oh, no, you've got to do it this way. Let, you guys are new to this whole Bible thing. Let's, let, we're going to show you how it's going to be done. And no, all you men, you've got to go out and get circumcised. Sorry, fellas, it's tough, but you've got to get out there and do it. And um, so they were doing the same types of things, imposing Old Testament law, the Torah, on Christians. So that was a, a very common thing. What else do you see in here? They were poor, yeah. but they, they were, were rich. rich. And I'm, I'm thinking they were rich in what actually mattered in their relationship with Christ. But according to the world, they were poor. Yeah. Anything else? are getting ready to go through some really bad time. Yeah, they are. Yeah, and there's some interest, interesting history to go through, too, during this time that I wouldn't mind spending time on, but uh, it's all really fascinating. <clears throat> okay. Pergamos. Now, it's an interesting thing here in this letter that I want to point out. And that is, um, with regard to this church, I think I mentioned this before, first or second week, probably. But when we were talking about, it's probably in the introductory, introductory in the first week, we were talking about the dating of the book of Revelation. And our amillennialist friends and others will sometimes want to push the date even before 70 AD because remember that's when Jerusalem was sacked. And that would explain the future tense, the, the future, whole future language of the book of Revelation is if 70 AD is in their future. And they go, oh, 70 AD came, look, it, it's all fulfilled. And that's what it all happened. Entire book of Revelation, 70 AD. Um, there are issues with that that we discussed, and we'll get into that more at length. But that's part of the reason for wanting to push the date up. But we got a problem here with this one. And um, let's take a look at, at Pergamus, because Pergamus will kind of, kind of date this book. Because most theologians and even... Worldly architects will put it more like 96 A.D. So let's let's read what was going on at Pergamos. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things say he who has the sharp two-edged sword. So we get a hint that the word of God is very important here, right? The way he presents himself here. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name, and did not deny my faith, even in the days which Antipas was my faithful martyr who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. Now, Antipas historically was not martyred until 92 AD. So the Holy Spirit in his wisdom... Um, made sure that this got in here. Jesus in his wisdom dictating it to John when he said, John, write this down to the church, of, to the church in per Pergamos, right? And that's what Jesus said. So he's got Antipas mentioned in here. So these events that are written down in Revelation all were post 92 AD, definitely. So it couldn't have been, couldn't have predated 70 AD in the sacking of, of Jerusalem. So that shows us what? 
that what you just said about the 70 AD. The... What does it tell us about the book? That it was written after that. Because he said when he was martyred. Yeah, it speaks of the martyrdom and past tense. Yeah. And specifically, though, the events that are laid out in the book of Revelation have to be yet future. Yeah. Right? So that means if those things by 92 and following haven't happened by then and they didn't happen in history, we're still looking to those things coming coming to pass. There are a lot of things too textually that you've got to be, you, and you see the reason why some people fall into symbolism. You've got to fall into symbolism when you get into Revelation chapter 6 and it talks about a fourth of the world being destroyed. Yeah, and that's in the seal judgments. And then you get into the trumpet judgments, and then another one-third of the world is destroyed. This has never happened in history. No way have you ever had those, either in land mass or in people, any combination thereof or division thereof, that's never happened. So it's all clearly future. And I don't know what the why the why people fight that and resist that so much. To me, um, the fulfilling of God's promise because the book of Revelation, the apocalypse, is the revealing of Jesus Christ. It's not symbolic language to obfuscate. You know, all the details about Christ coming and, and uh, the rapture of his church. I mean, it's something to look forward to. It's our blessed hope. The world is cursed and God has through all these centuries and millennia given us so many opportunities to repent and turn to him. And all man does is scorn God. And, and now in this, this age where now even his, who claim to be his churches, are profane, right? So the world's getting evil. So he's going to take us out of the way. If you believe in the rapture, and I do, he's going to take us out of the way. And then he's going to pour out his wrath on the world. And we see wrath right away at the, in the early stages of the tribulation in chapter 6, right there at the seals, wrath. So it's the wrath of God, and all that is is it's God uh, pouring out judgment on a sinful, unbelieving world and then taking creation back and establishing paradise on earth, setting up his kingdom on earth. So it's a great and glorious thing to look forward to, and I don't know why people would resist that or not want to see that, and why people would do they think that these events are so extreme that it seems like, wow, that's pretty harsh, God, that you would do that? I don't know what the mindset is about why you'd say that can't be right. And well, I think it's fear. Fear? I mean, if people aren't really sure of their faith and they're not sure that they're saved or they're not clear what that means, then you'd be afraid of, even if it's subconscious, you'd be afraid of that coming because you're not sure. You're not sure... Or if you're not, I can if see you're not that. sure about the rapture and what happens, then mm -hmm. you am I going before? Am I going in the middle? Am I going after? Maybe and it's scary. People are also afraid of of uh, for their loved ones. Yeah. The whole idea that but little little Johnny's not saved yet. You know, what happens if we get taken out of here for rapture and this stuff's still in front of us and I think of my loved ones who are gonna have to go through this? But what God does when we get into the tribulation and these things build is you've got one quarter of the world destroyed, then you've got one third of the world destroyed, and then you've got you know larger amounts during the during the bowls. It's going to be absolutely crazy when we get to the bowl judgments. But this is God doing a little shaking to get people's attention, and then He sends angels overhead to preach the gospel overhead. How crazy is that going to be? And and witnesses, 144,000 of them plus the two witnesses, and they're going to be doing miracles and doing all kinds of crazy things that should get people's attention. And then he's going to shake a little bit harder with the trumpets. And then with the bowls, it's like, wake up, you know. So this is God's mercy. So we see this, but, you know, our loved ones who might not know the Lord now, um, do you think this might get their attention? Will you hope and you pray so. But here's the thing of it. Jesus said that he would not lose one of his sheep that the Father has given him. So everyone who is supposed to get saved, um, all of the sheep will believe. And of course, not everybody will believe, though. Not everybody's sheep. We don't know who they are and what. Don't know how that works. I don't know the mechanics of how that works and how God figures out 
who's who or what's what. Um, and uh, I don't believe anybody does. But you know what? Not, not my business. He's a wise guy. He's all-knowing. He's sovereign. He's got this. He's got this. So we just pray for our loved ones and trust the Lord. It's not up to us to worry about them, to fret over them. We share the gospel with them. They hear the word. Once they hear the word, um, you know, that's Holy Spirit work, right? To make that seed take root. And that's what we pray for. So, all right, so this brings us up to verse 14, still about Pergamos. But I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate, as we saw in the previous letter, Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So what is this with, with um, the doctrine of Balaam? Any ideas or notions? Or what was the doctrine of Balaam? Is that the same as Moloch? Yeah, yeah I mean, there, was, there was that. Um, I mean, there's a lot of sexual immorality and whatnot, and they would have harlots there. I mean, they didn't call it that, but they would have the sexual things, and then that was part of their worship, wasn't it? Yeah, part of what's going on is, is there's a lot of com uh, compromise going on. So what happened at about 312 was Constantine. Anybody know what the deal was with Con Emperor Constantine? He Constantine, you know, remember the church was under persecution and was constantly under pressure and under persecution. Constantine came along and um, allegedly, and I have no reason to doubt it, although he was misguided in many ways, allegedly Constantine came to Christ. So what he did is he made it the law. Great. You know what? All y'all are going to be Christians now. It's now the law. You have to be a Christian. Can you make a law like this and make somebody a believer by having it be law? <laughs> you can't, can you? So it's a little misguided. I appreciate his enthusiasm, and by virtue of the position he was in, he could make an edict. But here's the thing is that the church decided to compromise him because people liked, um, like Balaam, they had their different holidays and things. Okay, and this is where the compromise started. They had mother and child. You know, they, they had Semiramis, they had Dagon, so they had mother and child. They used to worship during the holidays. They had gift exchanges. They had a Yule log they did, which was basically like sacrificing a baby on the fire. And all these pagan rituals and things. And, and Easter, Estarte, um, so what Constantine thought would be a great idea and he agreed to was let's just Christianize all these pagan holidays. That way you can have your cake and eat it too. Okay. Well, you like your gift. Okay. Well, now it's the saying that this is this pagan goddess and her child. We'll say, uh, well, let's just say this is Mary and Jesus. Oh, I know it's the wrong time of year because Jesus was probably born during the autumn, during the fall, but we can make it here. We can celebrate it here. So there's all this compromise because people were like not about to give up all their rituals and all their holidays. And so this way you can have it all. Now, I'm not stepping in here and I'm not, this is something that you pray out and you seek the Lord about regarding <laughs> holidays. Uh, and there are a lot of things that we do today um, as as churches, as individuals, as families that have pagan roots. Um, more than just the holidays, though. Man looks at the outward and God looks at the heart. So there's got to be a coming home to Jesus moment where your family sits down and you pray, or as the mother and father of the family, the head of the household, whatever, where you decide, have to decide how you're going to couch this, how you're going to phrase this, where does it, where does this leave 
doing some stuff for fun and what type of constraints do you put on that um, and and where it goes into your compromise you're living like Pergamos and you're in comp compromise and you're got too much of this pagan stuff going on and I guess mostly we can say clearly that it's absolutely compromised if if you're into the whole Christmas and Santa thing and into the whole Easter and Easter Bunny thing and Jesus ain't in it at all that we could say definitively beyond that that's something to pray about there are a lot of articles out there and that's not this isn't the form to go into all that but it's something that really we should we should think about and think about the message that we're sending to the world but none of that but think about whatever message when we're making those decisions about what we should keep and what we should eject does this profane Christ in our worship for Christ what does it do for him does it hurt his feelings at all um, so we we need to have those moments where we're really sitting down thinking about it and praying about it and you know what that might change multiple times over the years adjust a little bit we at one point with our family was like you know what we're just gonna as far as the gift giving goes we, our kids went through an era where they're went through, they went through that greedy stage it was all about how many presents well she got I want you know and you, you go through that era where um, kids can go through who's got the most and best presence and the biggest and all this. So we cut all that off and say, you know what, this is, you know what, this is more about Jesus. What are we, we kind of, isn't this celebrating his birthday? So we got to where we, we were for a while there, a few small gifts for the kids, small gifts for each other, no big giant massive whatever. I want the Xbox and I want the PS, any of that, small gifts. You know what? When it's your birthday, on your birthday, we'll get you a big gift. But no, not Christmas, because Christmas is about how about you know working at a soup kitchen? What about what we give to other people? Those kinds of things. So you, you so you got to make some decisions and try to figure out ways that you're honoring the Lord, you're teaching the kids the right values, and you're showing um, unbelievers and other believers what you're really about. And um, these things are important. It's an important discussion to have because. We don't want um, to walk in compromise as, as, as they were inclined to do here. Um, he who has an ear, verse 17, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. And I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. That's going to be kind of awesome. Gosh, there's a lot in here we could get into, and I encourage you to study some of these uh, churches on your own. A lot of rich history here. Uh, Thyatira, thia, thia, yeah. Real quick, what yes. version are you using? Um, the New King James? New King James, yeah. So I bounce between New King James and ESV a lot, so depending on how it's worded. I'm just curious because a couple of translations I looked at don't have a phrase that was in here. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> New King James, yeah. Different, different manuscript. Yep. Thyatira, oh, boy, boy, you'll see some things in here that are, are really, really obvious, I, I would think, but, but this is the church in the Dark Ages, and it really does match the Roman Catholic era. Um, and to the angel of the church of Thyatira, right? these things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith and your patience, and also, and as for your works, the last are more than the first. So a lot of works going on there, okay? Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality, and to eat things sacrificed to idols. There's so much in there that we could read, but I don't think it's an accident that Jezebel is mentioned as far as a replacement, a pseudo Mary, because what happens is, is everything becomes about Mary and about she's the central thought and worship and go talk to Mary and hey Mary, can you go talk to your son and can you go and, and all this type of stuff and. Um, calls herself a prophetess. She's the go-to. She's the in-between in so many different ways. So she, she is the point person here. 
not really marry herself. Marrying herself would be appalled at what she's seen come out of the Roman Catholic Church. I'm confident of that. Teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality. Yeah, maybe some actual sexual immorality. And there's some stories there that I won't get into historically and some things they found, you know, where the nuns lived and all of this and buried underneath in the dungeons and stuff. Pretty horrific. Eating sacrifice to idols, the idolatry, uh, not just the Mary worship, but, um, you know, as we know, all the statues to the various saints and go light candles to them, and you have the saint for this and the saint for that, and you pray for this, and, and you genuflect, and you, yeah, it's, it's out of control. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. When was her time, when did, when would she be given, given her time to um, repent? Reformation. Or reformation, exactly right. She didn't repent, so a lot of people stayed there. And, and <clears> like, <throat> You know, you can go in and you can read like uh, Matthew 22, for instance. You know, a lot of different passages, 23. Um, read various passages, particularly in Matthew, about um, the Pharisees. But when you're reading about the Pharisees and the things they did and the way they behaved and what they imposed on people, very much like the, the Catholic Church, the priests in the Catholic Church and what they impose on people. A lot of parallels that you could... You could line out, and they brought the little hems of their garments so they're recognized on the street. And uh, they like to be recognized and to get that kind of attention. And um, they put burdens on people and aren't willing to lift a hand to help them necessarily and that kind of stuff. So it, it's pretty bad. He says, indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation. Meaning... In my personal opinion, um, knowing some people, I believe in the Catholic Church. There are still some believers. I don't believe they believe official Catholic doctrine. I, you cannot believe official Catholic doctrine to be a believer. No way. It completely supplants Christ. Okay. But there are a lot of people who go there. Uh, they're they're um, Christians. They're ignorant. They don't get into the Word, which still is not good, or they don't get into the Word enough. They're very specific or localized when they get into specific passages when they get into the word they um, they they like the the ambiance of the building and it just feels so you know cozy and and holy and sacramental and it feels so you know uh, so heavenly look at the stained glass it's hushed and quiet mm -hmm. Ooh, the bells and the little ding, ding. It feels like we're doing something. Ooh, lighting incense. It feels like something good is happening on our behalf for God. Good, because I don't want to have to repent and change my life. I just want God to just forgive me and move me along. So, um, But I don't believe most Christians are who are in the Catholic Church are going to stay there very long if they're also getting into the Word and if they're really praying and they're really pursuing Christ. There's no way to do that for any amount of time at all. I think there'll be some correction that will get them out of that church, just like any church that maybe has a false system or has got some nonsense going on, or like we talked about a little bit last week, some of the legalism. So, um, but no, you cannot believe in the official Roman Catholic doctrine um, as the priests do, as they affirm, and as the nuns affirm, and the Pope, and so forth, and go into heaven. There's no way. It's complete blasphemy. So I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. I will give to each one of you according to your works. So he's going to give according to your works. And what happens according to your works according to Paul in Romans? If you're going to try to go to heaven by works, what happens? By works, by the law. It's not going to work, yeah. work out very well, will it? Yeah. yeah. Because we can't. It's either the work of Christ or it's your own works. Which way do you want to try to get to heaven? Mm. Mm. That's a tough one. So those who commit adultery with her um, are going to go into the Great Tribulation. The Catholic Church is still around, and this will demonstrate to be true. What other, whatever handful, small remnant are in the Church of Thyatira, the Roman Catholic Church, they'll be raptured, and that boy, will they be surprised. Um, but the rest are going through 
Great Tribulation. Um, now to you I say and to the rest of Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine and who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast with what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works, keeps my works until the end of him, will I give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, right? Not the Pope, not Mary. He shall rule them um, with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like potter, the potter's vessels, as I also have received from my father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has a, an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I'm telling you all, I'm skipping a lot in here. <laughs> okay, Sardis. <clears throat> As I said, there's overlap. We still have Roman Catholic Church. So you still have Thyatira going on, right? But then we've got Sardis here. And Sardis is, is the dead church. So you got Thyatira going on, the Roman Catholic Church. And let's look at what it says here about Sardis. And, and tell me if anything jumps out here. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God. Um, some people will translate the sevenfold spirit of God. And that's from Isaiah. That's another story, another study. And the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive. But you're dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready, ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief. You'll be caught off guard and completely by surprise, right? And you'll not know what hour I will come upon you. Yeah, because you don't believe in the rapture. <laughs> so surprise, you have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white. White is the symbol for what again? Holy, yeah, holiness of God, right? Sanctification, we're in God's glory. For they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. Yes, because they'll be raptured. And I will not blot out his name, from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So, anything <clears throat> pop out on that? On, on, on that. It says here, um, per your chart that I set down and don't no longer have in front of me. Sardis is roughly, it's a long chart. I don't want to flip back. What year is Sardis? 1520. Okay. So how is, sorry. Go ahead. How is the church of Sardis different than the church of Laodicea? Laodicea? Yeah, I, mean, I know we haven't gotten to Laodicea yet. <clears throat> there's a lot, of, like I said, there's a lot of overlap, but What's coming out of here specifically in the era that we're looking at here is you've had the Roman Catholic Church. Out of the Roman Catholic Church, Jesus told Thyatira, I've given you the chance to repent, but you didn't. You know, so Thyatira, he's getting out of them because they still didn't have their chance to repent is the Reformation. So you have the Reformers come along. We had these for um, morning Bible study the last couple of weeks, a little bit about the Reformation and some of those people, the Reformers who came along. So... He says, I know your works, that you have a name, that you're alive, um, but you're dead. So they're still trying to climb out of that and strengthen the things which remain. So you have a name that you're, you're alive, in other words, that you're re reformed, you know, right? right? You were dead, now you're reformed, you're new. Um, strengthen the things which remain, continue reforming. In other words, don't just sit there on, on the, what the church fathers came along with, you know, with, whether it was Hus or whether it was Luther or Calvin or whomever, um, 
Continue reforming. Strengthen the things which remain. Don't just sit there and go, oh, good, you saved us from that system. Great, thanks. No, no, keep reforming. There's still some more changes that happen. you got to keep growing. you got to keep pursuing. And they didn't. They kind of got a, um, a little bit complacent at, at some point. Of course, at first, there was a lot of persecution from the Roman Catholic Church. Um, but at some point, you know, you, you've got to, you've got a name that you're alive because you're reformed, but yet you quit sitting on 500 years gone by over <coughs> reformers. Yeah, now, I look at a lot of the, the modern Protestant church, you know, the Lutherans, named after Luther, mm -hmm. you know, they're not really alive. <laughs> yeah. Know? So, I mean, there's a lot of, there, there's still some good churches, but you get into things like United Methodism, you get into, you know, Wesley's, I'm sure, spinning in his grave over what's happened to the Methodist Church. Right. Um, and just, you know, they say they're alive, but they're not alive in Christ. Mm -hmm. So they've got their Bibles, mm -hmm. okay? they got their confessions. And um, so everything looks like it's great. Now, the difference with the Laodiceans is, is that there doesn't even so much pretend to be um there's, there's no real clinging to the word no real devotion i guess to the I bible was, i was just told there the girls and i are talking about in our we're doing the holiness but um you know jared packer and knowing god talks about in the beginning about the balcony people and the path people and now the balcony people are all about the knowledge and whatnot and they reach over and they talk to the path people and they you know they go over and over but they don't have the passion they don't have what they need to get on the path to holiness yeah. So then there are other people that have the passion and walk on the path. Home. So they're dead. Yeah. They've got the right names. They do the right things. They've, they've got their, they get, just show up at church and they're very sacred, very proper. And they um, read, read their Bible, read their confessions, they read the, you know, whatever they've got. They do their hymns and they're very, sometimes they can be very proper, very staid, very, very exact, <laughs> very rigid in what they're doing. They have their what? They have the appearance. They have the early the appearances outside, there. The, the Laodicean church, they don't even make a pretense of right. devotion to the Bible. I look at the dead churches as being like the Anglicans and Episcopalians. The Anglicans, Episcopalians, good examples too. Like you said, they just... They're in they had a history. That's the sad thing is they had a history. Yeah, but you know. they, they, in their sermons, in their services, it's, you know, it's rough. It's just... I, I think of it really, as like, a um, good way to put it. There's a lot of people that like will just outright reject the church. Like they accept Christ, they have all the knowledge that they need in there at a certain point, but then they reach a point of just being like, I have everything I need. I don't like the people here. They're, all, they're everyone else but me is wrong. I'm right <laughs> in my theology. So yeah. I just. Oh, well, that's very much like the Church of Ephesus, but yeah. yes, that still happens yeah. also in this type of a yeah, yeah, like, like I'm not thinking more of like the personality, not really the church, but like the, the individuals, dead, people, the yeah. dead believer, because it mentions like, uh, yep, like it's a few of you will still be uh, through there because like people right. are saved, they just fall out of the way. Like I was dead for a bit there because like I I believed in like 2008, but then I stopped going to church. My family was like, we don't need this anymore. It's not needed so you just sort of live in like you know you're saved but you also aren't pursuing anything mm -hmm. you're just you're there going through the motions you're just going through the motions it's yeah. you have like a, no works uh like you so i have found your i have i'm not finding works perfect before god like because you haven't done any work you're not mm -hmm. working you are you believe but you don't do anything with that you yeah. just sit there that's sort of what uh, sorry it's a, and his, and his message is the same as it is to most of the others that we've read in here so far, is it's repent, you know. And repentance, you know, yes, when we are convicted of our sin by the Holy Spirit, we see the state we're in, we repent, and we come to Christ, and we should be broken. But you know what? Repentance should happen regularly, because we sin regularly, and it's repentance goes beyond just ah i'm sorry god and i do that sometimes too but it's like you know that's really profane lord forgive me help me to to live better give me wisdom correct my thinking in this 
and sometimes I might find myself repenting more than once a day. <laughs> you know, so sometimes, so repentance is something that should be a lifestyle for the believer as, as we pursue holiness, pursue well, holiness in Christ. I think this was from um, the Jet Tour, I don't know, but he said, whoever I, whoever's notes I have here, it says hmm. that A through E are steps to repentance in here. And the first one is wake up, strengthen what remains, remember therefore what you have received and heard, obey it and then repent. So in there he put the, the steps of repentance for them. But, yeah. Yeah, that's very good. Okay, so let's. I'm determined here. <laughs> we can't battle. Philadelphia, the faithful church. Um, I want to show you something here. Philadelphia is the faithful church that exists definitely today. <clears throat> and I have this little chart here. And it's from Revelation 3.10. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, we're going to look at this. But there's a promise here in Revelation 3.10 that's very interesting. So if somebody who tries to say there's not a rapture has a really difficult chance in time with this verse. So I just want to call, call it out at this time. So, but let's look at, let's look at the, uh, Actual passage, read through it once, and then we'll hop back. Does that sound good? So Church of Philadelphia, brotherly love, right? Starting verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts, and no one opens. So Jesus here has all the keys. Jesus has always had all the keys. And I know it's a very popular Southern Baptist kind of a thing to believe, but Jesus never had to go down into hell and wrestle for any keys to anything from Satan and get them back. That never happened. It's not in the Bible. You won't find it anywhere. No. Jesus is he who holds the keys. <laughs> okay? That's a separate study we could go into sometime. You know, I remember talking to some Mormons one time, and they thought they were really clever because they're going, oh, Jesus is God too? Who was running the world while Jesus was in the grave? Ha, ha, ha. Well, because his body was in the grave does not mean that Jesus was spiritually dead and was not doing anything, okay? The, something Jesus was very busy doing, besides he says, this day you'll be with me in paradise. Jesus went to paradise or Abraham's bosom, and there he hung out for the most part, three days. That's what was going on. So anyway... Uh, that's a sidebar, but uh, Jesus has always had the keys to all the doors, to everything. Keys to hell and death, whatever. Um, no one else ever had them. No, Satan never had them. Verse 8, I know your works. And if you have any questions about that, you can ask me afterwards. We'll get into it, but no. I know that might wrinkle some people you know, along the Bible belt, but no. <laughs> Verse 8, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, oh, there's the synagogue of Satan again, who say they are Jews and are not. Oh, and it so has the Jews attached again. Remember we were talking about Hebrew roots type people? So the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews, but they're really not Jews, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you because you have kept my command to persevere. I will also keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Oh, come quickly, Lord. Hold fast that what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of <clears throat> heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, 
Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Wow, that's powerful, and I love that. And, of course, every church in the world likes to think that they're the Church of Philadelphia, the faithful church, right? I mean, let's face it. Everybody likes to admit that's their church. Yes, my church is the faithful church. But is it really? So that's something that everybody needs to look at. And if you're into the Word regularly and you're into prayer regularly, the Lord will show you whether or not you're the faithful church and you're in the faithful church, one of the faithful in the church, that type of thing. Um, so that being said, what else do we notice in here? What, what else jumps? Anything else jump out in that passage? And Sarah had mentioned before, in the persecuted church, there was no admonition there for them. The same with Philadelphia, with the faithful church. It's just saying, keep doing what you're doing. Keep doing what you're doing, and I'll keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world. Okay, let's look at that now, and, and maybe that will spur some more questions too. So, all right, highlight that verse again. Okay, specifically what we're talking about, verse 10, because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world. What hour of trial is ever going to come upon the whole world? Tribulation. Tribulation. That's the only thing the scriptures ever talk about. Where else is it mentioned? Let me just throw some, yeah. the tribulation. Where do we see some stuff about tribulation mentioned in the Bible? Just generally, there are some micro verses in the minor prophets that looks, oh, Joel, there, the blood moon, and all that. That's yeah, that's during the tribulation, but I mean day specifically, day Lord, yeah. yeah, the day of the Lord. Anything about the day of the Lord and the day of judgment, the day of his wrath. Um, and we also have it mentioned in, in uh, Matthew, 24. Matthew 24, go to Daniel 9, we have it mentioned, right. And the whole book of Revelation, from chapters 6 all the way through 19, it's a tribulation. So yeah, that's this period. That's the only time something's mentioned that's that's global. Um, I will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world. And what's it going to do? It's going to test who? Those who dwell on the earth. Yeah. Well, if the church is here, we're dwelling on the earth, so it's going to test us. So where are we here or are we not? Yes. Well, I was going to say in a different translation, this one says for those who live, and then in the NLP it says for those who belong to this world. I just thought that was interesting. I don't belong to this yeah, world. But, yeah, and, and in the Greek it kind of gets that that across, and that's why some of the, you'll see a lot of variety in the um, translations, in the various English translations for that. Because, again, like like I just now read just in the, in the New King James Version is... Um, Okay, it's, it's a test. A trial is going to come upon the whole world, but what's it for? It's to test those who dwell on the earth. Okay, so you're going to keep us from it, but yet the trial is coming on the whole world, and, but yet the trial is for those who dwell on the earth. So am I there or am I not? See the problem there? So those who both don't believe in the rapture, you've got a problem. Well, God's going to preserve them through it just like Noah did on the ark. Well, that's not what it says. He's going to keep you from it, and it's going to come upon the whole world. Um, but even that uh, Noah's Ark analogy is not really accurate because God took them above, you know, out of the floodwaters, not right. You know, he didn't take them through it. He didn't build a submarine. Arm. He built an ark. Right. Yeah. So. yeah. Well, and he says, you. And they were on earth. You have kept my you, and then he says, upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Yeah, so it's a very much an us and them kind of a deal. Just like you get the us and them language going in First Thessalonians chapter 4 and 5 when it talks about uh, all the trouble, the wrath that's going to come upon the children of darkness. But you don't have anything that you need to worry about. Paul gives no admonition, in, and we'll get into that starting next week because we have to start getting into the rapture, and we're going to spend, we're going to camp out we might be here a month talking about because, I, like I said, I've got a video for us to watch, um, which is Before the Wrath, great video, and it's coming down in price. But um, there's, a, we're, I want to go spend some time in, in the Olivet Discourse, okay, and, and looking at First Thessalonians 
and looking at some of these different passages about rapture because this is very um, a very hot topic right now that's very much contested and uh, you get contested by all kinds of groups of people who say there's no such thing as a rapture the church is going to go through tri tribulation no there's no tribulation that all happened in 70 AD the world's just going to continue to go and the Lord's going to call us out and you get another group that says no 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 the world's going to get better and better and better and then finally Jesus is going to kind of say you know what you guys are doing an awesome job down there I'm going to come down and join you instead of my kingdom so you get that too that's post trip so I, I know it's kind of <laughs> Yeah. 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 The translation of along, I don't think, is a good translation. <laughs> because the Greek word is to dwell, to live. And I don't belong, it's kind of a. I mean, I'm just saying. Yeah, no, I'm just saying. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But it's true that yeah, we don't belong here. We, don't believe, and we won't be living here at the time. Well, let's look at this real quick, okay? So. Part of this is, is if John wished to communicate the church was going to go through the tribulation, there are four other ways in the Greek that he would have done it. Okay, just looking at the original Greek. Otherwise, <coughs> tereo ek is improper Greek grammar. If we're supposed to go through, and tereo ek is what he uses in the Greek. <coughs> it means to keep out. Okay. There's a eru ek. And that can um, mean take out, but uh, it means to save out. This could mean that believers would go through the tribulation and then be taken out of the tribulation. So somehow, God, I need to put a force field around him, you know? <laughs> that would be a different. So he would use arrow, ek. And John did not use that. Arrow, apple, to take from. This would mean that believers would go into the tribulation, maybe, and then be taken out of the tribulation. There's a terio in, to keep in. This would be a promise of preservation in the tribulation. And I hear a lot of this from people that, well, you're going to go through it, but God's going to, he's going to be right along there with you and helping you through it. Uh, terio dea, to keep through. This would be a promise to keep us through the tribulation. In other words, you're not going to be, um, you know, the church is going to go through it and God's going to preserve you somehow to the end. So um, if you don't maintain a pre-trib position, uh, the plain and simple approach, you have to discard it, what it, what it says, and even translates well enough in the Greek in this case, and you have to examine the verse for loopholes. Uh, so a common approach is to look at the term Terrell Eck and argue that the promise in Revelation 3.10 is to keep the church safe within the period of time, not to take it out of the time. And they will try to use John 17.15, where the same Terrell Eck is used um, and is then appealed to. So you can turn real quick to John 17.15 and whoever gets there first and wants to read it, read John 17.15. It's important because you might get this thrown at you someday. <laughs> and I'm trying to record this. So hopefully it's recording and it's capturing the sound and everything else. If you have to revisit this later on and play it back and jot John, some notes, you can. John 17, 15? John 17, 15. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. Keep them from the evil one. Tierra Eck from the evil one. So it's then pointed out that the Lord isn't Pray for his disciples to be removed from the world, but to be kept safe from the evil one within the world. Therefore, the same principle applies in Revelation 3.10, and God isn't promising a removal of the church from the period of testing. So there are problems with this argument. Okay, first, it's like nice try, Covey, but um, first is the fact that the Lord actually says that he isn't asking his father to remove his disciples. So that's the first thing, is he's saying, I'm not asking you to remove them. So he actually says that there. That, uh, that phrase he's using, uh, areo, areo ek. And he says, I, I'm not asking you to take them out. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, some, some translators have it that is tero ek in no, there. The first part, it says, I do not ask. 
Oh, the first part, yes. Yeah, I do not ask you to take them out. That's Right, don't take them out. Tereo Act. That Tereo Act from the middle one. Yeah, keep them from, keep them from the middle yes. one. Tereo Act. Right, that's yeah. what you said. I was just about the second one. <laughs> But couldn't it also be the people that are born during the tribulation that are believers? Well, I mean, that much is true. They're kind of stuck, aren't they? Yeah, they're here. I mean, they're, they're here. here. Yeah, they're they're going to figure believers, out that. So wouldn't he protect them? But see, the, the, the thing with Revelation 3.10, as with Thessalonians, as he's talking to specifically the audience in those cases, is the church, not just believers. Like, that wouldn't apply to the Jews, the Old Testament Jews, or even the tribulation saints, which also could be Jew or it could be Gentile. It's, it's any of the believers at that time outside of the church. Remember, the church is a very unique entity, and it's another study that maybe you know, we, we're, we're going to have to get into and touch on a little bit, but it's different because the bride of Christ started in Acts chapter 2. Um, again, talking about John. Um Again, he isn't asking his father to remove the disciples from the world, and that's significant, especially in light of John 14, verses 2 and 3. Um, somebody want to take a quick look at that? John 14, 2 and 3. Anybody? In my father's Bueller? house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am. Yep. Yeah. There you will be awesome. Sorry, I, had to, I went to the song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a good song. Um, so we're going to go be with the Lord. We're not going to be left here. We're not going to be coached through it. We're going to the Father's house. It's being prepared for us. So uh, what's the point of asking for something to not occur if it isn't going to, to in the first place? So he's got something very specific he's asking the Father in, in um, John 17. Also in John 17, 15, in, in the second part of that, the Eck reference is to the evil one and not the world. He's saying, don't, you know, in Revelation 3.10, we're going to be kept out of the world. We're taken, taken out of the world. Here he's talking about Satan, not the world. So there's a distinction. God doesn't keep them safe from within the evil one. Okay, He's from the evil one. Um, Satan, and he doesn't remove them from within. That has already been done, but he keeps them out, Tira Ek, of the, of, the, of the evil. So he keeps us out of the evil. Third, this is the third and the final one we'll cover tonight. If protection is understood to be within, then how effective is it when considering the martyrdom of believers and the fact that they are conquered by the beast in Revelation 13, 7? Are we then to conclude that the martyrs weren't Philadelphians? Right? Because we have believers that are given permission by the beast, by the Antichrist, to persecute and to um, the gates of hell will prevail. Yet the gates of hell are not supposed to prevail against the church. How does that work? The gates of hell prevail or they don't? And they're called tribulation saints, not tribulation saints, not the church. Exactly. So, if you have questions about, about that uh, offhand, and if there's any details about any of those points I made, like I said, we could play it back or see me afterwards, but any other observations about that? Do I have some good comments? So, it's exciting to be in the righteous church and to be in God's team, and uh, <laughs> yay God, and to... We'll get into it when we get into Revelation, but uh, the city of my God, the New Jerusalem, um, that is also identified with the church when you get into Revelation 21 and Revelation 22. But it's all identified with the bride of Christ, by then the wife of Christ, because it's ours. And this is the room edition that the Lord speaks of and he goes to his father's house, in my father's house or many rooms. I'm going to go prepare a place for you. This is New Jerusalem is it. So that'll be fun to get into as well. We beat this one to death, Laodicea. Let's go ahead and read that as we wrap it up for the night. This sadly, sadly is, is our current state of um, particularly the Western world, although I understand the word faith movement is growing in a hellacious way, which is very much consumer-based entertainment-based type of a church model. 
um, is growing in, in the Orient, and it's in India and Pakistan, it's in Africa like crazy, it's in Australia, it's through the whole world, it's awful. Okay, but, um, okay, the lukewarm church. Verse 14 of chapter 3, And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness. Yeah, that's him. Not like you guys are being with your, you know, your fake Jesus. The beginning of the creation of God. I know your works that you're neither cold nor hot. I can wish you were cold or hot. So then because you're lukewarm, neither cold or hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich. I've become wealthy. I, I don't need anything. I have need of nothing. And do not know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Right? Because it's name and claim it. I got it. It's mine. What's well, there from the taking from me? Right? Come to church, sing my songs, have the lights on, sing the praise music. Yay, Jesus, thanks for all my stuff. Because all i got to do is ask for it, and God is the great genie in the sky, and he's got to give it to me. It's awful. I counsel you to buy from me gold, not sprinkled from the rafters, the fake stuff, right? Buy from me gold refined in fire, the real deal, not fool's gold sprinkled down from the rafters, that you may be rich and white garments, holiness, people, come on, white garments. They're not your cut-off shorts and your skinny jeans and whatever else you get on the stage with your rock music and everything. Purity, holiness that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. And as many as I love, I rebuke and discipline. In other words, there are some in, the, in there who are in there and don't belong in there. I'll, I will discipline them. I will rebuke them, and, and hopefully they'll get out and leave. And we've met a few people, and some here in this church who said, oh, I used to go to that kind of a church. Man, it was awful. I just want a church that preaches the word. And we hear this sometimes. So he rebukes and he disciplines, and people are leaving that system, but it's awful. Therefore, be eager and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Let me in. Let me in. Remember me? It's supposed to be all about me. It's church here. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. You're not the I, I am. the I am. I don't care who, who your name is as a, as a pastor. You know, Ken Copeland saying, I'm a little old I am. No, no. you're not a little I am. You're a little I want to be. You're a little, you're a little I want to be, and you're a lot, you know, unless you repent, you're a lot going to hell. As I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So, so there's Alexis's answer to the difference between Philadelphia and Laodicea. Is Philadelphia was cold. And dead. Well, was it just no. Philadelphia? No, I meant Philadelphia. Yeah, Sardis, Sardis. 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 They yeah. were cold and dead. This one was neither. They never had him. They never anything. They were. It's a false system entirely. Yeah. It's a prosperity gospel. They never had Jesus, but he said, "I'm not going to let me in." They got their fake healing. He says, "You know, he's talking about." Uh, you know, anointing their eyes so that they can see. In other words, you know, I got real healing here. The, you know, that you anoint your eyes so that you can really see because you need to see your nakedness. Interesting. Man, the Spirit just nails them on this. Just boom, boom, boom. The three things that he talks about, right? You, you say you're rich, but you're not. You say you're, you know, uh, uh, what's the next one? Basically, the, 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 the uh, garments, the white garments and the mm -hmm. eye salve. Mm -hmm. Well, Laodicea was a major trading center. It's a left. It was on the crossroads between you know some of the major routes. It was a banking center. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of rich people there. Mm -hmm. So if you're rich, you think you're rich, but you're really not. It was also a fashion center. Yeah. They had, were really proud of their their garment garments that they made there. Certain colors that you can only get there. Yep. Yeah. And and so it hits them with that. And they were also a medical center. And one of the things that they had developed was an eye salve for people with diseases in their eyes. And so Jesus is saying, no, you're blind. Use my eyes. <laughs> yeah. You know? And in, in today's church, like I said, it's the same type of thing because, oh, we've got the healing. Come up here and be healed. You know, and Benny Han, I'll wave my coat at you or whatever. And, like, 
kick you or hit you on the head or whatever, and you'll be nah, I, you got some. I always ask those guys, if you have power of healing, what are you doing here? Why aren't you in the hospital? Yeah, really. You know? That's not how the disciples did it when they were on the world, was it? Yeah. So that's the seven churches. And, and some of this, like I said, there's a lot of overlap. There's some good stuff. I encourage you to pursue this on your own and um, get into it. But there's all, a lot of little gems. Right? And like Larry just gave some historical examples. In the history, there's a lot of great gems. If you go in and you get a good Bible dictionary. Remember, I had some out last week and on a little table here to show some examples of reference works. Um, good Bible dictionary or encyclopedia, and you can get into, into some of those. And... Um, they're great with the history. So any other questions or comments before we close in prayer and we can continue discussing afterwards if we have any more observations about any of these. It's good stuff though, isn't it? And you can I hope you can see how we started off with these particular seven churches and why they're here and how they apply, how they apply through history, how they apply to our churches and uh, us as individuals. So they're cautionary tales for all of us, right? With that, let's close in prayer. <clears throat> God, thank you so much for uh, the epistles of Jesus Christ to the seven churches, the seven epistles. What a blessing. And uh, Lord, thank you so for some of the, the cautions that we have in here. Um, thank you for what we can learn from each one of these churches and to not be that way as individuals and to seek to be proactive in church, to be uh, salt and, and light and exhortation and encouragement to our fellow believers within the church that it never deviates in, in the wrong direction, that these would be discussions that we could have. And um, God, we, we pray for wisdom as we come up now in Revelation chapter 4, and we start talking about the rapture of the church and how we do escape at Revelation 3.10, how we do um, become uh, rescued from what is about to come upon the world and what that looks like and all the different teachings and the different passages. We pray for wisdom, God, and insight, and also compassion and patience when we're discussing with people because it can get aggravating, and sometimes it can be, you know, we can that our tempers get flared up, we get really hot, and we don't want to do that way even if we receive it. And most of the time, in my experience, is it's something that we receive. But help us not to lash back or to lash out, but to be compassionate and, and thoughtful and um, just keep our noses buried in your word and in prayer. For it's in Christ's name we pray and give you all thanks and glory. Amen. Mm.